Uh, Chairman, uh, I wish to thank the uh, Royal Institute of Arctics and the Arctics Alliance for coming here today. Uh, it is a subject of considerable correspondence uh, for a period of time to members of the House and this committee in particular. So it's, it's op an opportune time to hear both sides of the story, uh, as it were. Um, I, I'd put it to you, Mr. Gravy, that there is a perception that the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland are operating a closed shop and an exclusive club uh, because of the registration fees, the technical examination methodology uh, that, you, that you use. And that's something that I'd ask you to maybe comment on. And in particular, the appeals board, who are they? Uh, if there is a majority or not of members of your organisation on it, who are the technical assessment board? In other words, who signs off on all of this paperwork that uh, sets down the standard uh, for to be met to become a member of the RAI? And you will be aware as well, of course, that there's not only confined to the architect's pr uh, profession, there'd be a, quite an open debate with members of the House about self-regulation versus state regulation. Uh, and it has, there is considerable mixed views, whether it is doctors, dentists, accountants or architects, you wouldn't be all uh, excluded from that particular uh, assessment. Mr Montu, uh, you stated that, that we need, we, because we do not meet new standards tailored to suit our competitors, you might explain to us, the committee, if the uh, scope of the new standards have begun, gone beyond the scope of the Building Control Act, and how? Uh, because standards seem to be an important issue in terms of interpreting who was actually included or excluded. Um, the proposed registration fees, which I understand if you were to take uh, the examination and the technical assessment, could be up to €20,000 in this jurisdiction. How does that compare uh, to other jurisdictions uh, in terms of the technical examination and the uh, the examination that's required in the Republic of Ireland. I'm not clear on the, where the figures come from in terms of how expensive it is, and I'd like to know what it is in other jurisdictions. Um, the other matter that you mentioned, you, quite, you, 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 you were quite distasteful to your colleagues here in relation to uh, the technical assessment proce procedure has been devised by them, in other words, to compound the perception of a closed shop you might explain like, how you've come to that conclusion. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by the pres missing prescribed register admission examination. Uh, you might maybe let us know about that. And finally, Chairman, um, are you saying, Mr Montu, that, that the scope of implementation of this uh, Building Control Act in respect of architects has gone outside the law? and the spirit of what the Building Control Act was setting out to do in, 19, in, in, in the 2007? And if so, how? Deputy Brady. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'd like to welcome both organisations here today. And, uh, you know, like uh, Deputy Hogan, I would certainly have uh, some concerns, uh, you know, dealing with architects for uh, I suppose close on 36 years now and numerous occasions and we all know during the, the, the boom times that, uh, you know, particularly in, in rural Ireland, uh, difficulties for young people acquiring planning permission and, you know, I'd have to say that uh, there are some excellent architects out there and, you know, we, we, the the Architects Alliance, you know, are talking about um, self-taught taught architects. And indeed, when you look back in this country, some of the finest people, uh, business people, and created business across this country were people that were self-taught. And it's not always the people that. Uh, gets the highest standards of education are always, you know, the, the best person to do a job. And I'd have to say that, you know, that um, uh, some of those people and indeed, you know, people that I know that are in the, the Alliance and indeed people that are in the Institute, you know, are very fine people, as I said earlier. Uh, but um, I, I'd have to say that the self-taught people are 
a lot of the time are very understanding and, uh, you know, the... the, the Brooke, your deputy, but if I could have an awful list to speak Sorry, on this, speaker, I, if we could, will, if we could I, confine I, our contribution to the questions, we'll have to come back to the panel as well. I certainly would like to, to, to well. compliment them, and indeed, as I says, when you're dealing with these people, they are very, very understanding and knows the situation and knows the problems of, of young people, particularly looking for planning and mission out there. And... Certainly, I, I would be fully supportive that the, the grandfather clause should be included there for those type of people because of the work they are doing. And, you know, they have trained themselves. There are some very fine people out there that has trained themselves. And I don't think they should be excluded. I think it would be very, very unfair. And certainly anything that I can do, and I'm sure that Deputy Hogan has said it as well, you know, that, that the, the, it, it has happened in other countries, uh, the Europe, other European jurisdictions, and in America where registration was introduced, uh, the, the grandfather clause was included to facilitate people in that position. And, you know, I certainly would be fully supportive of that. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Deputy Lynch, and please now, if we can have questions, if we can combine the questions, we'll be better off. For everybody's sake. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, I have some experience, albeit in a different area, of a process where accredited prior learning was taken on board, where educational institutions, the Department of Education, uh, HETAC, and other agencies were brought on board to arrive at a qualification that needed to be put in place. Now, applying my own experience and having gone through the process of putting portfolios and everything else together, uh, I'm quite interested to hear what uh, the both groups have actually to say this afternoon, and I understand that Mr Garvey has brought a copy of the portfolio, and I, I'd be interested to see that. However, what I would like to know is, we, we had a situation in Ireland where the term architect could be applied where anybody literally could bang the sign up outside their door and operate. That was a difficulty, and it certainly was a difficulty in the area that I was working in as well, so we had to sort it out. However, the net outcome of this at times can be that people who are qualified in some areas don't actually get recognised by the new structure that's put in place. And I'm listening to Mr O'Neill there with intent interest. And often, very much, courses actually become franchises. They become business operations where an earning can actually take place. And I wonder to what extent we were seeing the franchising of a qualification taking place under the guise of an educational structure, where it's not, it's actually a standalone enterprise industry. And that was one of the things we were very, very careful of, is that the ownership of the course remained within the Department of Education, and I'm at a loss myself as to why the accreditation of architects in, the, in terms of academia is not located within some area of academia as opposed to a standalone company. That's a question that I'm still trying to answer in my head from the very, very beginning of this debate. There is also the, uh, I would be interested to hear both from both groups what they see as the registration difficulties and hindrances to that process and what sort of suggestions that they would have in relation to it. Now, uh, Mr Garvey made mention of comments by Deputy Roach during the course of, of when the bill was actually debated and died. However, there was actually, to my knowledge, there was two ministers actually dealt with this bill as it moved through the House. There was Minister O'Keefe and then there was Minister uh, Roach. Now, a document uh, commissioned by my own party colleague, Rory Quinn, who was an architect by profession, I believe, gives quite, and is available here in the House, it gives quite a detailed uh, insight into what actually happened when the grandfather clause was actually being debated during the Building Regulation Act of 2007. And it's quite specific. I, 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 it's quite specific as to what the grandfather clause was, and it was in the bill for a period of time. So I would correct you on that. And it, it, when it was in the bill, it said the, re the registration body shall establish a register of architects for the register. Each of the following is eligible for registration to register, and a person who has at least seven years practical experience of performing duties commensurate to all those of an architect in the state is at le least 35 years of age and has passed the prescribed register admission examination and a person who has been assessed as eligible by registration by the Technical Assessment Board in accordance with the practical experience assessment procedures. So there was, at one stage or another, the concept of a grandfather clause actually in the bill at that time. However, it was when the bill actually moved into the Senate 
and quite extensive debate took place. And I, I would consider the RIAI, along with other groups, were lobbying politicians at that period of time that a whole series of senators started adopting a position that becomes quite similar to what the RIAI are actually presenting here this afternoon. So I would be interested to know what lobbying of senators during that period that your group actually got involved, partook in, and what was the, the purpose of that lobbying, because it would certainly seem to me that following that lobby, Minister Roach then, as a successive minister, actually came in and changed the landscape as to how the bill was going to proceed into the dial. What I'd also like to hear, and this just comes back to my own educational experience, is there are three routes by which somebody can become an architect, to my understanding. There is somebody who Maybe like this afternoon, I would decide to become an architect and I would proceed on an academic journey and accumulate a number of credits over a period of time that would give me my degree or qualification in the area. Then there are those who have been practicing for 10 or 15 years plus, and there are those who maybe are practicing for five or six years plus, and I would put this question to the Architects Alliance. They, they, we, there's obviously not going to be a grandfather clause for that group. You, you, I don't think you're promoting a grandfather clause for that group. What suggestions do you have for, the, for that group of people? Because while it might be an accusation that the, the RIAI are putting up the ladder, there might be an accusation that you're putting up the ladder as well for those under the 10-year period. So what solutions do you see to those people that are actually under the 10-year bridge? But what I'd like to know is just to, if Mr. Garvey in his uh, response can indicate to me the three types of approaches that can be taken, the cost to the three types of approaches that can be taken, the cost per person that's, that that's actually working out, the cost per year that that's actually generating, the number of tutors, the number of examiners, and the number of assessors that are actually partaking on it. Because I understand that one of the registration processes is, I, I think it's, is it just 48 people going through it a year? There's no tutorials taking place in it, but the cost of the course is approximately half a million euros. No, given that there is no teaching delivery on the course, there's no teaching delivery. All there is is an examination of portfolios I find it very hard to my mind to understand how you can actually have a delivery of an educational program at half a million euros a year whereby you're not actually delivering any teaching. Thank you. Uh, Deputy General. Yes, uh, well, I think, uh, Chairman, everybody's agreed that um, if a consumer uh, employs an architect, uh, he or she is entitled to assume that the professional concerned is not a dentist or a doctor. I think we'll all